Please welcome Ignacio Munoz San Juan. Hello, uh, thank you so much for the invitation to speak here and tell the story of CHDI. I think my talk is going to bridge a little bit about the philanthropic aspects and how we, um, uh, people like myself, are recipients of the generosity of private donors uh, to advance the development of effective therapeutics for the treatment of a mental disease that is paradigmatic, such as Huntington's disease. Um, Huntington's disease is a monogenic disorder. It's different from a lot of the other neurodegenerative disorders in that sense. And therefore, it represents a unique opportunity to try to understand in great detail the progression of the disease, but also theoretically to develop very effective treatments that are very proximal in nature, such as, for example, targeting the cause of the disorder, uh, um, which is a, muta a single mutation in a single gene called Huntington. Uh, as you can see uh, in the curve on the right, um, the age of neurologic onset of the disease that is based on clinical diagnosis by a neurologist, typically based on the motor component of the disease, uh, is uh, um, largely dependent on the number of repeats in the expansion of the, of the gene that is mutated. But as you can see on the y-axis, and I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer, so I can point, but there is a very wide range of variability in how early people manifest uh, or get diagnosed with clinical symptomatology in this disorder, suggesting that Mother Nature has found very effective ways of either advancing or delaying the progression of the disease. And this is important in, in, in our efforts to try to understand how to mimic what nature already does. Okay, let's see. Okay. Um, maybe somebody can turn on the video on the upper right panel that says 2008. Um, Huntington's disease is typically considered a movement disorder um, a disease, but its symptomatology extends way beyond the motor component. That's just the most visible one. There are significant cognitive and psychiatric behavioral problems that are thought to arise in the brain mostly because of dysfunction of the basal ganglia. If you see this video here of a structural MRI superimposition of 120 patients' brains, showing the year-on-to-year -year degree of degeneration in the uh, basal ganglia structures, particularly in the caudate putamen. Uh, there are other clinical features, and the role of the foundation is to slow or delay the progression of the disease, not only affecting the brain component, which is probably the most meaningful, but also other organ systems that are affected by the disease. If you'll see in the lower panel, you can see two figures. The first one is a superimposition of 120 uh, control brains or control subject brains in a structural MRI scans. And on the right, um, it's a brain that looks to be abnormal. Um, most people would imagine that this is a symptomatic set of subjects. But when you look at the uh, scans of HD, you can see that the disease begins its manifestation, at least at the level of neurodegeneration of the basal ganglia, between 15 and 20 years prior to clinical diagnosis. So this tells us two things. First thing is that the disease symptomatology, even though it's not clinically apparent, is probably present, probably, if not since conception, certainly very early on. Um, the second component is that it takes a very long time for the um, um, uh, ability of people to live normal lives to be compromised by this large extent of neurodegeneration, which is a good sign for all of us trying to develop therapeutics. That means it, it gives us a very long period of time to intervene and stop the clinical manifestation of the disease. Okay, so who, who is CHDI? You've heard a variety of different models, privately funded, publicly funded. Um, we are funded by a few private donors whose families are affected by Huntington's disease, and therefore we have a single focus, which is to be recipients of a wonderful amount of money. Um, we don't have a budget, we spend money. Um, this year we probably spend about $140 million in all aspects of research and development, including the uh, clinical work, trying to organize the clinical community, um, influencing the development of better rating scales for clinical trials, funding academic labs, and also developing therapeutics in collaboration with existing partners as well as internally. Um, the, uh, internally at the foundation, there's about 80 people, mostly uh, project managers, uh, PhDs, MDs, chemists, biologists. We, we work, and this makes us probably unique and probably the reason that I'm here, we work um, to a very large extent through collaborations. We don't have any 
beautiful buildings where we do our work. What we do our work is through collaborations with um, uh, external contract research organizations or in collaborations with pharma and biotech industries. In addition, we have a very large portfolio of academic labs that we, that we fund, exceeding 100 in any given year. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of the types of questions that we're trying to answer and how we organize ourselves to, uh, to, to be effective. Okay, so in terms of the pillars of the foundation, I just wanted to run through some ideas that we've tried to build the company around in order for us to be successful. The first one is that uh, we needed to identify, recruit, and enable the best academic investigators. This wasn't a given when I started seven years ago at the foundation to focus on Huntington's disease. And this means that we need to facilitate their working together for knowledge integration and also dissemination of information. You heard about this early on. It's not a trivial process. Second one is that we should leverage the billions of dollars that pharma has spent. We don't have competitors. If anybody develops a therapy for Huntington's disease, the donors will be happy, the patients will benefit, we win. So our role is to enable as much work as possible in, in, in the treatment of this disorder. So we need to identify the best partners and the best assets and don't waste any time, but not in the business of trying to reinvent the wheel. If somebody has a therapeutic that may be applicable to HD, we're going to do the work that we need to do to convince them that they should do a trial for Huntington's disease. The third one is, and it's critical to any drug discovery enterprise, particularly a genetic disorder, is to access the most innovative technology and integrate that technology into HD research, particularly at the level of gene therapy. The fourth one is because we really can't trust that anybody else is going to solve this problem. We need to develop our own capabilities to experimentally reproduce critical findings, but also do the kinds of things that nobody else will do. And I'll give you a few examples of why that's important. And finally, in order for all of the research to be of any translational utility, you need to do clinical trials. In a rare disorder where the patients are limited and spread all over the world, doing a large phase three study, it's very difficult. So in order to do this, the foundation set, uh, start, started building a very large network of clinical centers around the world, and also a program, a platform called Enroll HD, and you can go into the website and click on it, with a targeted enrollment of 30,000 people who are gene positive for, for, for the Huntington mutation and try to get them engaged both in uh, observational studies as well, as well as in clinical studies. Okay, the development of the capabilities to drug campaigns is a fundamental concept that distinguishes CHDI from other philanthropic drug discovery organizations. We're not only a funding agency. We are responsible for integrating information and also turning that information into hopefully molecules that can go into the clinic and be tested. Um, in order to do this, uh, in many instances, we need to demonstrate that a particular asset that pharma has developed or, or a particular hypothesis that an academic lab has developed, that that has applicability to Huntington's disease. And we also need to use internal laboratories to replicate findings, but also extend those observations to make it more meaningful from a translational perspective. So we work with a large number of CROs. Some of them are listed here. We do um, anything that any traditional pharmaceutical company internal laboratories would do. We just do it through uh, collaborations with people with different technical expertise. Okay, so with all of this said, what kinds of questions are we trying to solve? Because this is important in terms of laying out the strategy and the implementation of that strategy that will translate into who we work with and how we work. So the first one is obvious. You don't need to be a neuroscientist to understand if it's a monogenic disorder and you know the mutation in the gene, that if you eliminate the expression of that gene, hopefully you will have a very strong disease modification effect. So many years ago, even before I started at the foundation, we had decided that this was an area that we needed to drive. At the time I started seven years ago, no pharma company was really working in, the, in Huntington's disease, and a lot of biotech companies were developing gene therapy applications for other indications, not for, not for HD, it's too rare of a disorder. So we needed to identify the technology, identify the partners, fund them, and provide HD knowledge domain expertise in order to enable this work. Okay, so some of the companies that we worked with in terms of the therapeutic strategies targeting the DNA, targeting the RNA, or targeting the protein are listed here. The second component, assuming, and I will tell you more about those programs in a second, but the second component, it assumed that the gene therapy uh, approaches are just too difficult, something goes wrong, we need to have a backup plan. The second most proximal thing that we can try to do, and this is work that um, 
that is um, uh, that we're heavily invested at the moment is to try to modulate the toxicity of the protein that is mutated in HD by modulating its structure function or post-translational modifications. And some of the work that we're doing is in collaboration with Hilal Lashwell, who should be somewhere here in the audience. Okay. In terms of how success successful we've been so far, I think, um, I think we've been quite successful in the areas of molecular therapeutic development. So two other programs that we started several years ago, the antisensor oligonucleotide program by ISIS and also the DNA zinc finger repressor proteins developed by Sangamo with funding from CHDI were acquired. The programs were acquired either by Roche in the case of ISIS and by Shire in the case of Sangamo, and clinical studies are planned for this year or, or early next year. So all of that is wonderful. We've learned a lot along the way, but there's many other things that are still remaining in order to show that this approach can actually translate into meaningful therapies for patients and their families. Okay, so one of the key aspects of a gene therapy approach at the moment, given that the uh, delivery of these uh, agents will be restricted to certain regions of the brain, is, to, is, is, is of twofold. The first one is um, uh, the delivery component itself. Where do you need to lower the mutant, the mutant gene in order to have a functional effect? And second, even if you are successful in delivering it to the right place, how do you assess in a human living subject that you're lowering a protein for a whose function is unknown. So what we decided to do is to have a biomarker task, task force internally to try to generate evidence that companies who are going to be doing the clinical trials in HD could capitalize on our observations. So we needed to identify biomarkers that could be measured reliably in rodent models of HD and also in human subjects. Um, we needed to demonstrate that the biomarker could change in symptomatic models and in patients because that's the stage where the therapeutics will be tested. And then we needed to demonstrate whether lowering of Huntington in the mouse models, the experimental system, will affect the biomarker in a way that makes it useful for the pharmaceutical companies. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about two classes of biomarkers. The first one is a proximal biomarker, and this applies, I think, to any gene therapy approaches that one may be considering for brain disorders. The first one is it, it's measuring Huntington itself, so we needed to develop the assays to measure quantitative levels of Huntington in accessible fluids or in uh, developing imaging technologies to measure Huntington itself. No other organization was going to dedicate the amount of time and effort that would be required to do this type of work, so the foundation is stepping in to fill those gaps. In addition, just in case that proved to be unsuccessful, uh, there was a whole set of indirect biomarkers that are translational in origin that could be applicable to uh, potential clinical studies. And I don't have enough time to go through all of this. If anybody has questions, I can answer. But some of this we've already demonstrated that there are, they are modulated in symptomatic animals when you lower Huntington uh, in the brain. Okay. Um, one of the fundamental questions beyond all of this is in, in translational research is to focus on the right question. We know that, um, that the, the disease is caused by a single gene mutation. So we know at the beginning what causes the disease. We know what the disease looks like more or less to an extent. What we don't understand is what happens in between. In those 20 years between a person being born and a person uh, who starts having degeneration and then goes on into having symptoms. So some of our efforts are really directed at the basic science of linking the mutation to the clinical symptomatology that we're hoping to treat. Okay. In order to do this, there's two things that need to happen. One is we need to have a very deliberate effort to uh, fund discovery biology in a way that is informative for therapeutic development. And second, we need to emphasize a lot more um, work on human subjects because most of the problems that I see in treating brain disorders is that we don't really understand the disease in the human context. We know a lot more about what happens to the rodents than what happens to the subjects. Okay. So... Um, one of those mechanisms that we're trying to understand that is critical in the context of HD is the, the fact that the, a lot of the clinical symptomatology is dependent on degeneration of the basal ganglia, and therefore having a very solid program to understand how the basal ganglia is dysfunctional is, is important. I don't have enough time to go through all of this, but obviously understanding this microcircuitry within the brain, the systems approach is quite complicated, and one of the things that we needed to do from early on was to build a field that was essentially non-existent in the context of Huntington disease research, which was focused mostly on a genetic cell biology uh, component. So we needed to recruit investigators, develop models, including, for example, for optogenetic dissection of the circuitry, uh, in order to identify key neuronal, glial, and circuitry alterations that they, we can try to, uh, to rescue. 
we also had a very active collaboration with a lot of pharma companies. There's a lot of assets that are directed to the brain circuitry that is affected in HD from other indications, and we needed to test them experimentally. Some of that work has translated already in a molecule from Pfizer, PD-10 inhibitor, that we um, identify as a potential beneficial effect in the context of HD is currently in phase two. There's also other approaches that are not limited to small molecules. For example, we have very exciting data that glial transplantation in the rodent models of HD pr provides a very strong disease modification phenotype, highlighting the incredible potential of astrocyte function in the context of a disease that's always been thought to be of neuronal origin. And finally, a very strong emphasis of getting data from humans that informs whether the assumptions that we're making and are used to drive all the drug discovery campaigns are actually well supported by human experimental evidence. Okay. In terms of the next wave of discovery biology, we're trying to focus on ground truth, and I think this is important in the context of what was discussed earlier. Uh, we're trying to identify every genetic a uh, component that may modi modify the progression of the disease in humans by undertaking a very strong molecular genetics approach to identifying those genes. This is a big consortium that CHDI is funding. Second one is to put together a detailed molecular understanding of the effects or the expansion of the CAG, which correlates directly with the extent of progression. All of this is data that is multidisciplinary in nature across multiple labs, and information is to be disseminated publicly. So you see this link here, HD in HD, all of the RNA-seq and proteomic data that we're generating will be, will be accessible to everybody uh, for them to have access to that information. And finally, like, like I said, invest in large animal models of HD to bridge the gap between the rodents and the humans, and invest much more heavily in, in the humans. So this concludes my talk. I just wanted to close the presentation with a few key learnings based on my own personal experience in the seven plus years that I've been at the foundation leading the drug discovery efforts. The first one is that in order to be successful, we need to strengthen the scientific community around key mechanisms. And a lot of those mechanisms were being explored at sufficient depth in the context of HD, and experts in those mechanisms were not thinking or working in the field of HD. So we needed to identify them and convince them to work with us. Um, data, methods, and reagent sharing to enable the field is critical. Without this, the, we are going to continue to have a problem of data reproducibility, which really makes it very difficult to know if we're working on the right question. We needed to build a, a, an internal research infrastructure. We needed to integrate academic with industrial partnerships. This takes a lot of effort, but it's a very fruitful collaboration, and it can be done. Finally, trust and verify. Reproducibility of key findings in the literature, it's a big issue. So a lot of the work that we do with uh, the scientists in my team is to try to get critical observations and independently replicate them. We need to capitalize on industry assets. It's a faster route to clinical studies. And there is a lot of possibility, if you do a lot of the work and you have some money, that companies will be more than happy to collaborate with you. So you shouldn't shy away from asking. Um, invest in technology. In the case of Huntington's, gene therapy and delivery systems are critical to our success, and this is an area that we're currently investing heavily in. And finally, build out the ability to conduct well-powered longitudinal human studies. A lot of the lack of evidence from human studies is because they're cross-functional, they uh, are small sample size, uh, inadequate power, and therefore the conclusions are typically unsubstantiated by real data. And finally, for the donors and whoever is a philanthropist in the audience, uh, it's expectation setting. This is a very difficult problem. I think we can solve it, but it's going to take a lot of us thinking and working together. Thank you.